Hello, I'm Simon Newton and welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. Winning the peace is harder than winning the war, so goes the old military saying. But are we the West ready for what happens if Ukraine does win against Russia? All our allies agreed Ukraine's future lies in NATO. We're going to help Ukraine build a strong, capable defense across land, air and sea. Will there be a force of stability in the region and deter against any and all threats? The general who led Britain's post-war efforts in Iraq will share his thoughts on what else should come next. And Mike will explain the other big issues and decisions of the NATO summit, including what the UK has promised. Together with our G7 partners, we have agreed to provide the long-term bilateral security commitments that Ukraine needs. These commitments mark a new high point in international support for Ukraine. It's not all been about Ukraine. NATO's also agreed new regional defence plans. We agreed uh, NATO's uh, most uh, detailed and robust uh, defence plan since the Cold War. We strengthen our commitment to defence investment. But what can and will the UK contribute? Zitrev with Simon Newton and Professor Michael Clark. So, Mike, I'm sure you've seen a few NATO summits over the years. How big a deal was this one? Oh, pretty big. Uh, I mean, the last really big summit was uh, 2014, the Wales summit. And that was the time when NATO decided to name names to make it really clear that they need to up their game against Russian pressure, as it then was, and also take on the sort of Chinese strategic challenge. And so the 2014 summit set up a lot of boxes to tick, and NATO did tick all of those boxes, though none of them as strongly as it might have. And now this is the first real summit after the war has started. This is when Europe European security has fundamentally changed. And so this is NATO. And we all thought, you know, when the war started last year, that this would either administer a sort of shot in the arm or a shot in the head to NATO. And as it happens, it's a shot in the arm. NATO is very strong, at least for now, as a result of all of this. Well, with Mike and me to explain what it all means, we have two very experienced observers. Major General Tim Cross served for 36 years in the military and commanded a division in the British Army. Tim, from your experience, how does it feel to be a commander when one of these top level political meetings is happening, knowing they're making decisions you're going to have to uh, turn into reality, whether you whether you like it or not? Well, I have to tell you, it does feel sometimes a bit bizarre because you're listening to conversations and wondering, you know, what that actually means in reality. I, I was in Washington and then uh, Kuwait and then Baghdad. In I went into Baghdad as the sort of statue came down. You remember that, that picture of the statue coming down in Baghdad in, in early 2003? But in Washington, I'd sat in meetings with, with people like Rumsfeld. I'd briefed the prime minister and the foreign secretary and so on. And it's trying to, <laughs> frankly, it's trying to disconnect the hubris from the reality of what, what this all actually means. The reality is, from an Iraq perspective, of course, it all went badly wrong, the post-war planning, and we're still living with the consequences of that. Um, now, that said, it's, it's quite difficult to pin down what it is that people are looking to. Um, I, I think for Ukraine, I attended a, a reconstruction conference on Ukraine about six weeks ago. It was before the main conference that happened in London. Um, but, you know, that the planning for reconstruction does need to start now, and the planning for Iraq started far too late. So getting the, you know, the leaders of this situation, getting their minds around what this place needs to look like, how are they going to rebuild, where is all of the resources coming from, et cetera, and particularly who's going to command it, and recognizing that circling around Ukraine, there are going to be dozens, if not more than that, contractors and other people who will want to share in what will be a huge rebuilding um, cost. And where that money is going to come from is still, of course, to be determined. Well, we'll talk about that more in, in a moment. But with this also is Dr. Ulrika Franke from the European Council on Foreign Relations. Ulrika, you were in Vilnius for this summit. What were your, your takeaways from it? Mm. Uh, so it obviously was a very important and, well, to some extent, historic summit, although I think now in terms of um, history, they kind of pushed some of the expectations to next year's uh, summit in Washington, which incidentally will also be the, the 75th um, anniversary of NATO. Um, I think there were a lot of expectations with regard to the summit, especially when it comes to membership for Ukraine. Not all of these expectations were fulfilled. I have to say, I think maybe um, the countries should have done a bit better expectation management in a way because there were two yeah, two, two, two big expectations that couldn't be fulfilled. It was always clear that Ukraine would not be joining NATO um, while this war was still going on. 
Um, but yeah, so 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 I think there was some good and some good, bad there. What was obviously very good news was that President Erdogan dropped his opposition to Swedish NATO membership, and apparently then Orban also dropped his. So Sweden is becoming a member of of NATO, and there was uh, a lot of. Uh, happiness and, and applause for the Swedish defense minister as well um, at the summit uh, where I was at. News, discussions, and analysis. This is Sitrep. Well, before we dig into the detail of, of, uh, of what, we, what was agreed at the summit, let's look at an important question that was not answered, at least not publicly. You've said the whole summit has shown how close you want to bring uh, Ukraine to NATO. You've said that it requires credible security arrangements so these kinds of things don't happen in the future. And some of the biggest allies through the G7 have made commitments. What about some kind of peacekeeping mission once this is sorted out? And actually actually put your boots on the ground there if, NATO, if Ukraine can't come to NATO. I think it's wrong now to speculate exactly on uh, how this will be done in the future after the war ends. Uh, the most important thing now is to ensure that the war ends in a just and, in, uh, and lasting way. Now, of course, you may agree with uh, Jens Stoltenberg that we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. But let's remind ourselves of another long-standing military cliche, which is fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Tim, if I come to you, there are military and civilian aspects to this. Let's start with the military one uh, where your expertise lies. What would Ukraine need to do to secure a peace whenever that may come? Well, the first thing I would, I would say is the part, part of me thinks that the problem here is that the messages we're sending out need to be seen from a perspective uh, of a Russian perspective and a, and a Putin perspective. And the message is, is quite clear. They will join NATO when, the, when this war comes to an end. So from a Russian perspective, why do you want to bring this war to an end? Why would you not want to keep this conflict going over time? And uh, remembering that, uh, you know, places like Northern Ireland went on for 30 years, the, Arab, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian problem, the Israeli Arab problems have been going on since 1948. Um, and uh, the Cold War went on for an awful long time. So I, I think there's an issue here about seeing this from a Russian perspective. That's my first point. Second point in terms of the military is what are you going to need to, in order to ensure the future security of Ukraine? in terms of its materiel uh, and rebuilding the infrastructure and all of that stuff. And, and there's a huge list. I mean, in, in, from a civilian point of view, you've got all of the issues which we had in Baghdad, the sanitation, the energy production and distribution, uh, water, and, and all, the, all of those sort of humanitarian and inverted commas issues that need to be resolved. From a military perspective, I think there's something about uh, we, we don't want to be giving uh, well, we want to ensure that Ukraine can defend itself. But if it does come into NATO, of course, we are then obligated to uh, defend them if the Russians then decide to have another go. And and everybody, I think, would say that, you know, can we trust the Russians with whatever peace agreement they come to? There'll have to be some sort of negotiated settlement. But I suspect it could be something like what happened, what's happened in Korea, between North and South Korea, that there's going to be no formal end to this. Uh, and therefore, what we're going to need is to, is to put in place sufficient, as the South Koreans have done, with American support uh, to ensure that, uh, the, you know, the North Koreans don't invade. And, and the same will apply here. There, there was also the suggestion mentioned of a, of a NATO peacekeeping force. Would that, be, would that be a good idea, do you think? I, I would hesitate, to be honest. I'm not convinced that that is the right answer. Because, again, it's a NATO, the... a NATO force and the message that sends to Russia. Mm. You know, we, we have got to see this from a Russian perspective. I don't like them much. You know, I don't like what the Russians are doing, but we do need to understand how they will see this stuff. So putting a NATO peacekeeping force in there, if Ukraine is not a part of NATO or even if it is a part of NATO, does send a message. And I'm not convinced it's a, it's a, it's a good message. Michael, Michael may have another view. Just so you, you mentioned the reconstruction in, in Baghdad, for instance, does the whole military security really depend on, on a return to normality Absolutely. of civilian life as well? well no, no, I mean, the, you have to secure the environment within which you then do the reconstruction. And the big problem in Iraq was Rumsfeld's plan, such as it was, actually his plan was we don't need a plan because the Iraqis will welcome us with open arms. I mean, and I'm not exaggerating, but the, but the, the problem was they were, they reduced, they were going to reduce their military from about 150,000 Americans and 50,000 Brits to around 50,000 Americans and 5,000 Brits. You cannot and could not secure Iraq with those numbers of people. You have to have sufficient security on the ground to enable you to rebuild. And at the moment, as we've seen over the last 24 hours, the Russians are quite capable of sending in missile attacks uh, you know, and all the rest of it, unless, unless there is some sort of negotiated agreement. So securing the environment first and then rebuilding the, the infrastructure. 
Ulrika, if, if we turn to you, what what is the political landscape in Ukraine like? I mean, is it is it likely to be able to continue this national unity, this sense of national unity we've seen on how they return to life as normal? Um, I would think so, yes, um, as far as I can tell. Um, I just wanted to make one very quick point on what, what Tim said, because he said, you know, Ukraine will join NATO once the war ends. I mean... <laughs> It's definitely true that there has been much more unity among allies at this summit than there was, for example, in Bucharest in 2008, when it was first said that Ukraine was joining NATO. Um, so there is support for this. But we shouldn't forget that what the communique um, said is that there are that Ukraine can join once it has fulfilled certain requirements. So requirements regarding uh, democracy, uh, corruption, uh, security sector reform, things like that, and once the allies agree. And so it's not automatic. What they haven't said is that once the war ends, Ukraine will join. Um, that, by the way, I agree with Tim, would kind of create this kind of situation where Russia has every incentive not to uh, not to ever end this war. So, so there are still some some hurdles. Now they can be overcome very quickly. And in fact, the German defense minister um, last night on a TV interview said, you know, once the war ends, this can go very quickly, and that's true. And we see with Sweden and Finland how quickly countries can join if the allies agree. But there there are requirements in there, and you know, it can also take quite a while for Ukraine to fulfill them. So it's it's not it's not automatic, and we don't quite know uh, how fast this is going to go. Mike, in, if we talk about the reconstruction cost, I think it's been put at something like three hundred billion pounds, which I looked up today is something like three times the size of the Marshall Plan in today's money. Where is that money going to come from, and is there a will, you know, globally to actually support Ukraine financially like that? Uh, well, there, there will have to be. I mean, three hundred billion is the first instalment, according to the IMF. I mean, more realistic versions are it's more like uh, north of seven hundred billion. Um, as it happens, of course, there's, so there's about three hundred sixty billion dollars worth of frozen Russian assets. I mean, the Russians built up a, a sort of war chest before this uh, war of reserves, but half of them were held abroad, and they've all been frozen. And of course, a lot of people have said, okay, well, we've got these frozen Russian assets, then let's put those into the reconstruction as the first installment. That's difficult because there's a big difference between freezing assets and seizing them. I mean, it would seem logical to say seize them. This is an illegal Russian invasion. Just take their money and use it. But of course, that creates a precedent in international law. Assets belong to somebody. And yes, you can freeze them for all sorts of political reasons. But if you then take them, uh, then that's opening up a Pandora's box for the future. And powers are very reluctant to do that. The, the other thing I think is important is what Tim said, General Tim said earlier on, that there are there are huge opportunities when the reconstruction does get underway, and it will probably get underway before the fighting is over. Um, when it gets underway, there'll be lots of companies circling around. There is There are lots of opportunities because, you know, Ukraine is a big country. It's got a very big IT sector. It's got a very skilled workforce. It's got a big agricultural sector. It's got an awful lot of advantages. And there are huge investment opportunities in the fourth biggest country, you know, within Europe, a biggest landmass in Europe, one of the big four or five countries in Europe. As that leans, you know, irre inevitably towards the West, the be big, big investment opportunities. So it's not all a question of finding money that that you know, doesn't go anywhere else. Actually, as we're paying for reconstruction, it's also about getting a reconstruction process begun, which Ukraine will then be a great contributor to as it develops economically. Well, let's come back to where we are now with, with the war still uh, raging, no end in sight at the moment. One important piece that has been put in place is new long-term security guarantees for Ukraine. Those guarantees, though, didn't come from NATO, but they came from the G7 grouping of the world's richest nations, which, of course, includes the UK. Now, it's less than the NATO membership that President Zelensky has been uh, demanding. So how does what Ukraine wanted compare with what it got? This is the former UK National Security Advisor, Lord Rickett. What this summit does is show that Ukraine is moving closer to NATO. There's a piece of NATO jargon in the communique that says Ukraine will not need a membership action plan. It's got the most battle-hardened forces in Europe increasingly working to NATO standards. So it is on a fast track towards NATO. I think coupled with these bilateral security guarantees from the G7 powers, that adds up to a considerable package. These guarantees are not the same as NATO membership. It's not collective defense, but it's uh, an undertaking to arm uh, Ukraine, to structure the Ukrainian armed forces, to make Ukraine such a prickly hedgehog 
that the Russian bear will not in the future ever want to have another go at it. Mike, let's go back to you. What, what have we and the other G7 uh, countries actually promised with these security guarantees? Well, as of last night, more of the same. I mean, the G7 were there because at the summit, you know, Japan was there, Australia was there, South Korea was there, New Zealand, so on. So they were all there. And they said the same as, as is said in NATO, which is that we, we will not offer, we cannot offer a, an institutional guarantee, but bilaterally, we're all going to guarantee security. And what the G7 were really saying, and, and they said a bit more about reconstruction, creating this virtuous circle of more uh, work on um, working on uh, and anti-corruption and democratization that creates a more favorable investment environment and so on. All of that makes perfect sense. But what they were really doing was communicating to the Kremlin that we, the Western nations, in any forum, individually, in NATO or in the G7, are prepared to stick with Ukraine for, for as long as it takes. And those were the phrases that we used, as long as it takes. Now, whether the Russians will believe that, whether our own electorates will really believe that, we don't know. But that's what so far is being said. Ulrika, how, how do you think Ukraine's feeling about what it got versus what it actually wanted? Um, so I think they should be feeling rather good. Um, I feel that maybe this summit needed a little bit more expectation management in a way because there were some ideas floating around that were never going to happen. And I mean, you know, Zelensky said as much. He knew that Ukraine wouldn't be able to join NATO while this war was still going on. So I think there was there were a few weird discussions that that make it look as look as if Ukraine got much less than it could have. I don't quite agree with that. Um, the package that Ukraine got um, from the membership action plan being dropped to the multi-year um, support commitment, I think that's a very important one, is a good one. I have to say I would have liked to see a bit more positive language towards Ukraine in this communique, kind of recognizing how much they've already done. I mean, not just kind of militarily speaking, but also in terms of anti-corruption fighting and democracy and all of that. So I think they could have been doing more there. But, but yeah, I think it's... Yes, you know, they could have gone a bit further. They could have laid out the steps a bit more clearly. Um, but in the end, we all know, you know, the moment the Allies agree that that ukraine can join it can join very quickly and we're seeing this with with finland and sweden so so i i sh I, I believe that ukraine shouldn't be overly disappointed i don't think they have a reason to and um from what i heard from ukrainian um uh, participants at the conference they would have liked more but i don't think they're going home thinking this was this was a um, loss of time or at least i i think they shouldn't well, let's just talk about the politics of all of this, because obviously that affects the military commitments um, on either side of the war. President Zelensky uh, calling NATO's refusal to give a timeline for membership absurd. Uh, on one hand, you have the UK Defence Secretary saying Ukraine should show uh, more gratitude and this quote about saying we're not Amazon for weapons. It's not been the f show of full unity that, uh, that they would have liked. So, so Tim, how, how big a military commitment are those security guarantees we've made and how well placed do you think we are really to deliver them? I think it's quite difficult to know how, how you know, the, the full extent of them, and Michael referred to that. Um, I do think we need to recognise, and it should be said, Ukraine is suffering, you know, huge casualties and huge damage in this conflict. And they are, in fact, fighting a proxy war on our behalf against Russia, which is doing all sorts of damage to Russia, but means that Russia is not in a position to, for example, move into the Baltic states or wherever. They're not going to take on another campaign. So we, are, we have to recognise the, the huge commitment and inevitable commitment, I suppose, but nonetheless, the casualties, etc., that they're taking. And, and therefore, we, we do need to be quite clear that we, we must continue to support them in this. Now, the problem is, in terms of that support, what that looks like in terms of material, particularly, you know, at the moment, the big issue, of course, is artillery ammunition and the cluster bomb discussion and so forth. The bottom line is we are running out of stuff. The government have just signed a contract with BAE Systems, another 240 million, I think, to set up more production lines for 155 and indeed other calibers of ammunition. But these things take time to produce. And I think what, you know, behind Ben's comment is we have to recognize we need to continue to rebuild or start to rebuild our own war maintenance reserves on the basis that the unexpected can always happen. So balancing what we're giving to Ukraine and supporting President Zelensky, uh, at the same time making sure that uh, you know we're building our own WMR, we're, we're looking at, and it's costing us a heck of a lot of money. So our own taxpayers, and indeed we know in America, 
there's quite a lot of discussion about this whole business of supporting Ukraine. And a lot of the Republicans, uh, you know, are not, not, not that much in favor of it. They've been pretty vocal about that. So there's, there's a difficult balance here. But my own view is that we have to recognize that for Ukraine are fighting a proxy war on our behalf and we have to stick with it in the long term, however long term that is, as we've done elsewhere around the world. Enrique, do you think that he, this this conversation, if you like, between President Zelensky and, and Ben Wallace, do you think it will have any lasting implications, those tensions causing any damage? I don't think so. No, I think what we're seeing here is that, um, you know, the war has been going on for a lot of long time. Everyone is under a lot of pressure internationally, domestically. You know, uh, these are human beings. So sometimes you, you know, kind of frustration bubbles a little bit to the surface. I think this is normal and everybody understands this. I don't think this was particularly damaging and the relationship is, is very strong. And of course, the UK, the British support to, to Ukraine is incredibly important. Um, can I just end with, with one line? Because this is something I feel quite strong about um, because I wouldn't agree that that Ukraine is fighting a proxy war. Um, I, I don't think I, I don't think it's right to say that Ukraine is fighting on our behalf. Um, Ukraine would be fighting in any in any case. You know they're defending their their state um, and they're the defending their they're fighting for their survival. So even if there was no support whatsoever from the West, the Ukrainians would be fighting, just not as. Um, effectively, I guess, or successfully. But it's not a proxy war in the way, in the way that they are fighting on our behalf. And I think we need to be a little bit careful with um, with these kind of formulations. So I just wanted to kind of um, correct that, at least from my point of view. Mike, Ukraine and Georgia were told, I think, 15 years ago, they would become members of NATO and, and they're still waiting for that to happen. Is this commitment that we've seen in Vilnius any more concrete than, than what we've heard previously? Uh, oh, yes, quite a lot. I mean, in 2008 at Bucharest, that, that statement that Ukraine and Georgia would eventually become NATO members was pushed by the Americans. It was the Bush administration, Bush himself. Very foolish. And I, like many others, criticized it at the time. It's a stupid thing for NATO to commit to. And I said, well, eventual membership will turn out to be very eventual. But wars change things. I mean, the fact that the, the Russians have now invaded Ukraine completely changes things. And, you know, as John Maynard Keynes said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? And I'm in a completely different place now because the war has created the situation where only some form of NATO membership can guarantee the security of Ukraine and therefore the rest of Europe for the foreseeable future. And of course, we know that the war as a war is likely to get, it's generational. So it's going to go on as a war for 30 or 40 years, probably. But there may well be the chance of a ceasefire on favorable terms to Ukraine sometime a lot sooner, maybe next year, something like that. And in that ceasefire, if that can be created, then NATO has got to find a way to interpose itself to somehow institutionalize a ceasefire so that we can then work forwards to um, a different European security architecture. But this war has fundamentally changed European security. So everything that we thought before 2022 is not now very relevant as we go to 2023. And I think that this summit has recognized that structural change in uh, NATO's situation and European security. This is Zitrep. Well, the NATO summit also discussed, of course, and made decisions on the alliance's own security, and most notably these three uh, new regional defence plans. This is the next step in NATO's readiness action plan. Um, the announcement last year that it wanted to go from 40,000 to 300,000 troops ready to move and fight at short notice. Now, these regional defence plans are designed to set out how those forces would be used and where. Except, of course, Mike, we don't seem to have much detail on them, and those 300,000 strong forces haven't actually been generated yet. No, and, and nor is there a date or a target date by which they will be generated, except they'll be brought to high readiness. And Tim will understand exactly how expensive and difficult that is. Um, but they'll be brought to high readiness at some point in the future. And the 300,000 is will cover air and naval forces as well as ground forces. But it's a very big uh, aspiration to go from, I mean, 40,000 is pretty big compared to what existed before. And to go from 40,000 to 300,000 is a huge step. And I think we're talking about about, you know, during the decade of the 2020s would be my guess, but nobody's putting anything more specific on it than that. Tim, the view in NATO is that Russia isn't much of a direct threat to the alliance members right now because it's throwing all of its, uh, you know, its military weight at Ukraine. Is it realistic to think that this new force structure and everything it needs can be in place anytime soon? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think soon. I don't know what you mean by soon, but, you know, to build on Mike's point, 
when throughout the Cold War years, we had a number of these um, organizations and structures and so forth. And we, the UK, committed to certain states of readiness to support these various, um, you know, various plans. And, and, and a high state of readiness is a very expensive place to be. You have to have troops ready, not, you know, the troops ready to go, but you have to have all the equipment, all of the ammunition, the stores, the material in the round, uh, and all of the logistics support and everything else, communications, engineering, etc., ready to deploy to go and deal with the, whatever the threat is at very short notice. And when I say very short notice, we're talking 7, 15, uh, sorry, 7, 14, 30 days. We also held a lot of other forces at much lower states of readiness. And we also triple hatted. So we pretended that we were capable of supporting several of these different deployments at the same time. And one of the big issues in all of the defense work over the last few years is, you know, how many of these things do you sign up to uh, and how, how do you ensure that you have the ability and the capability to deploy at those states of readiness? Um, and I, uh, one of my concerns is, and you would expect me to say this in a way, we, the UK, do not have sufficient land forces now to put a a substantial, well, certainly an armoured division into the field. We, we now talk about brigade level or even battle group operations. Um, but hold, even holding those at high states of readiness is proving beyond us at the moment. So it's, it, there's a lot of a lot of expense needs to be put into all of this, and it will take a, quite a lot, well, a long time. And we're talking, as Michael said, you know, in the 2020s, maybe by 26, 27. Trouble is, we've got a prime minister, I don't think, who understands defence, and, and Ben Wallace has been fighting hard on our behalf, but we're just not putting enough resources into this to deliver the sort of figures we're talking about here. Well, Rika, can I can I just play you a bit from the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak uh, at his news conference? I was struck once again this week by just how valued our contribution is. The British people should know that, and they should be proud. We are the leading European contributor to NATO. We spend more than 20 other NATO countries combined but it's about much more than that. It's about our incredible armed forces across land, air, and sea. We're one of the only countries that contributes to every NATO mission with RAF jets patrolling the eastern flank, troops on the ground in Estonia and Poland as part of NATO's enhanced forward presence, and the Royal Navy, including our two aircraft carriers providing around a quarter of NATO's maritime capability. So, so that all sounds very positive, but you're looking uh, from the outside in. So do you have any sense of whether the rest of NATO actually has faith in our ability to deliver on that? Hmm. That is a very good question. So on the one hand, of course, the prime minister is, is right. I mean, everyone recognizes that the UK does a lot, not just to support Ukraine, but, but generally in, in NATO. Um, I think over the last few years, there has been also a kind of realization that that British capabilities aren't as strong as they used to be and that there is a budgetary issue and, and all of this so so this has been put a little bit more in question but it, actually what I what I found most interesting in Vilnius and also in the run-up to Vilnius is that we didn't talk that much about the British position in all of this. I mean, just just in terms of, you know, we, we were talking a lot about, you know, what does Washington think, of course, but also Berlin, what is Macron saying, et cetera. And, and, and the UK didn't didn't feature as much. And I just thought this was interesting because, of course, the UK is an important country. So so I'm not quite sure what's what's happening there. You know, there are also kind of fluctuations and things like that. But um, it's 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 not as if, you know, everyone is waiting for um, London to say something. Let's let's put it this way. Mike, just finally, Rishi Sunak promised ahead of the summit that the uh, UK's refreshed defence command paper will be out next week sometime. Did he give any clues to, on what that will mean for the armed forces? Uh, no, he didn't. But the timing gives us a big clue because this paper I mean, it has been delayed three times this year already and it's got to come out before the recess, which is now. If this Defence Command paper was good news for the armed forces, it would certainly have appeared before the summit so that it would be in the news when the prime minister went to the summit. If it isn't good news for the armed forces, they hold it back until after the summit. So... The fact that we're about to see it now after the summit before the recess means, in my view, it will not be good news for the armed forces. Professor Michael Clark, thank you very much. And also thanks to Dr Ulrika Franca and Major General Tim Cross. Kate will be back with another sit rep next Thursday. And don't forget, you can always catch up online at bfbs.com slash sit rep, the Forces News YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Simon Newton. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. 